Hello, Year 12 students. So we have made it to the final section that is Section 9 of Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. Thank you for joining me on the journey. Um, so I'm going to go into a little summary and notations and analysis, uh, starting with Chapter 53. Um, and so... Basically, this is there is a jump in the timeline. We've ended last section with Kirsten looking out through the telescope at a town that has electricity and streetlights and the sense of hope that amazing things can happen in the future. And suddenly, we're catapult uh, catapult as readers back to the timeline of the last day on earth for Arthur so it's right back pre-pandemic and it's a really interesting sequence here um so Arthur's definitely been sick he's got a headache he's had insomnia for a few days when I read this the first time I just assumed he had the Georgia flu but later I reflected that that probably wasn't possible otherwise it wouldn't make sense that um, Kirsten and Jeevan survived. I think they would probably have died also unless they happened to be, of, to be immune. I think that actually was more of the case that he just happened to die of a heart attack because he'd been run down and sick. Uh, but you may disagree with me and that's okay too. Um, but what you do notice here, he has been sick and the middle of the first page of chapter 53 um, he's made a decision. It's his last day, last morning on earth. He doesn't know that, of course, but he's decided when King Lear closes, he's moving to Israel. And he's exhilarated by this idea. Um, he's going to shed his obligations and belongings and he's going to start over in the same country as his son. He's going to buy an apartment within walking distance of Elizabeth's house and he'll see Tyler every day. And so it's significant there that he has decided to shed his obligations and his belongings. There's a sense of yearning for connection. And in that same way to in the post-pandemic world that people recognize what's important to them, even though he hasn't realized that it's his last day on earth, it ha does happen. There's a mirroring here because he's also reflecting on what's truly important to him, and that is his son, the yearning for connection to the people who are truly important to him. Um, and um, I noticed there's a number of sections where Arthur has noticed natural beauty here, starting with the beauty of the pigeon's luminescent neck right at the bottom of this first page. Um, and he arrives in the theatre. He's exhausted, so the room feels oppressive. He feels guilt and regret. And there's a number of times in this sequence where there's the beginning of um, deep regret and later on it becomes very strong but he regrets um, Miranda being dragged into the tabloids um, by the way I never really thought the fact that we probably should define tabloids um, um, tabloids are newspapers that are a smaller size than broadsheets and tabloid newspapers tend to have a little bit more gossip in them than uh, more serious newspapers perhaps. So tabloid are um, newspapers that are slightly more gossip focused than news focused, I guess. Um, and anyway, he's remembering them, these things. Um, he's remembering in this sequence as he's regretting part times in his life he he's also remembering people important to him his ex-wife Miranda he remembers Clark and this coffee shop they used to go to and it's interesting because Clark had um, been magnificent actually in retrospect so Arthur has these sort of charitable admiring thoughts about Clark despite the fact that earlier he's been dismissive of him in some of his um, meetings with him over coffee and dinner um, and not valuing the friendship, um, using him in a way in his later years. At this day, he's actually re reflecting and um, valuing Arthur's, I mean, Clark's friendship. Um, he wants to call his son, but it's 4 a.m., so he can't call his son. And then he has this conversation with Tanya, who is the woman he's having an affair with, um, and he's tired with insomnia, 
Um, he says he, he's captivated by her excessive youth. He's, um, she's just just over half his age. Um, he forgot that he was supposed to beat her for breakfast. Um, they dead cell phone battery, couldn't get in contact. She's like, whatever, let things go easily. And he thinks that is um, amazing. He adores that about her. And she's like, you look really terrible. Are you sure you're not sick? He says, I'm just tired. Um, and then uh, she asks about the Station Eleven comic. And my ex-wife dropped it off a couple of weeks back, he says. Tanya says, which one? And he felt a flicker of sadness. This was a sign of having gone seriously astray, wasn't it? Having more than one ex-wife. He wasn't sure exactly where he'd gone wrong. So again, this sense of regret over his failed relationships appears for the first time on his last day on earth. Um, and then he, she, he's told her he's trying to shed his possessions. He doesn't know what to do with it. He sent one to his son and what do I do with the other one? Um, he confesses that he never really understood the point of it. He doesn't really value the comics that Miranda painted, especially the undersea. What are these people waiting around plotting for what? Tanya likes it. Tanya values the art um, and Arthur doesn't seem to. Um, but Tanya describes it as beautiful, um, particularly the paintings. And then Arthur gives Tanya the glass paperweight uh, Miranda had couriered to him two weeks ago. It's on that his very last day on earth. Um, he's shedding his um, objects, belongings, and when he sheds this paperweight, because it has no significance or no beauty for him, he says there's no memories attached to it. It's a glass lump in his hand. So while others view it as beautiful, he views it as a glass lump, um, which really has connotations of, um, I don't know, what a lump. It just makes it feel like it's nothing. And so the last thing he wanted in his life was a paperweight. Tanya, on the other hand, says it's gorgeous. And um, so that's the final significant moment with the paperweight, the movement of the paperweight that we're tracking from character to character. Um, Kirsten then arrives and says, my mum bought a, bought a book with you on the cover. This is Dear V that she's not allowed to read because it's inappropriate um, and that's why she takes it with her. Um, and we notice that Kirsten's mum is presented here as kind of a managing stage mother. Uh, so bottom of page two, 321, um, the one time that Arthur had met Kirsten's mother, she'd cornered him to ask if he'd had any projects coming up with a part for a small girl. He'd wanted to shake her. Your daughter's so young, he wanted to say. Let her be a kid. Give her a chance. I don't know why you want this for her. He didn't understand why anyone would want their child involved in movies, which is so ironic because Arthur himself doesn't fight for his son while he's still alive or value his son while he's still alive. Um, but the recognition here, again, in his last days on the earth um, of the importance and significance of human connection is highlighted. And um, he gives the Station Eleven, Dr. Eleven comics. Station Eleven comics? Dr. Eleven, I've been calling them Station Eleven comics the whole time. The Dr. Eleven comics um, to Kirsten. He didn't want the comics because he didn't want possessions. He didn't want anything except his son. So his last want, the last thing he wanted on earth is his son. Um, and it's, again, ironic because I wonder what would happen, would, what would have happened if Arthur had a chance to be father to Tyler and be an influence on him with this revelation that he's had. Would Tyler's outcome have been any different? It certainly makes us think. Um, and then Arthur has this moment of having, of reflecting on the pleasure of being with other people. People are what's important is um, at the end of his life, he's finally coming to realise this. And then he decides he's going to pay off Tanya's um, student debts, $47,000 worth. He 
wants to be known as the man who gave his fortune away. Again, money, money and material possessions are not what's important, which he's also beginning to realise. Um, he, um, he feels a peace about this. He wants to jettison everything that could possibly be thrown overboard, this weight of money and possessions, and in this casting off, he would be a lighter man. Um, Mandel is certainly reflecting on what is truly important in the scheme of survival. And then and one of the last things he does, he calls Tyler. He's like, just give me two more minutes. I know he's just waking up at 6 a.m., but I just want to hear his voice. Um, and so Elizabeth puts him onto Tyler and Tyler's angry with him. Why are you calling? I just wanted to say hello. Well, why weren't you here for my birthday? And it's interesting because um, what, I've, what I noticed there is that we see Tyler as a needy child who feels abandoned and rejection from his father, this sense of his seven, eight-year-old kid and, and who his father promised he would be there for his birthday and he's not. And you can imagine um, that the the pain that that would cause. And we can, we can kind of infer a little bit about how Tyler's character is shaped there. And they bond over these comic books. Um, Tyler tells his dad about Dr. Eleven, who lives on a space station. Well, it's a planet, but it's a little planet and it's sort of broken. I love that. Like this world is sort of broken and it went through a wormhole. It's hiding in deep space. Its systems were damaged. But so on its surface, it's almost all water. And it was a mistake, Arthur recognises, to let Tyler get so far away from him, but perhaps it wasn't unfixable. He has hope to be able to fix this relationship. They live on islands, a city that's made up of islands, bridges and boats, but it's dangerous because of the seahorses who can take them down into the undersea. Don't forget the symbolic nature of belonging to the undersea, just like the prophet. And the undersea, well, it's an underwater place. They're Dr. Eleven's enemies, but they're not really bad. They just want to go home. I wonder if this also is a powerful moment where we could talk about Mandel's views and values there. Is anybody really bad or are they all just trying to survive somehow the best that they can? I don't have an answer because the prophet seems pretty bad. But um, just in the way that Arthur redeems himself at the end, perhaps there's some redeeming features there when we learn of Tyler's beginnings. I don't know. Um, so they tell each other they love them and they hang up and then there is the sequence where Arthur is on stage and he's thinking. And as he's thinking, he's remembering and he's regretting and he remembers a moment from his first marriage from, with Miranda where she stumbles and sprains her ankle and he's kind of embarrassed and he knows it's, it's going to be in a tabloid story and he snaps at her. So there's, it's like he's remembering these regrets or his sins even and she says, I repent nothing in the mirror and he hears this and his words, these words stay with him. And I love this quote here. We're on page 327. So he was a man who repented almost everything. Regrets crowding around him like moths to a light. Notice the simile and the description, um, the personification of regrets crowding him. Um, so you've got some great techniques there. So Arthur is full of regret and the volume of regret, so the sheer volume of regret, he regrets his relationships and things he's done and that he has, wasn't proud of. He re regrets the way he dropped Miranda for Elizabeth and then Elizabeth for Lydia and then let Lydia slip away and how he let Tyler be taken to the other side of the world and, and he didn't even know his only brother. And, and so in his last moments, the internal kind of thoughts of him as he's consumed by the sheer volume of regret um, he's trying to make a secret list of all the good things in his life. He's trying to comfort himself by remembering what's good. And, and there's this um, interesting because they're the things that are important in life. And there's some things in nature, pink magnolias and Tyler, Elizabeth, 
dancing with Clark, Miranda's eyes when she still loved him, and Lydia, people that he'd loved, Tanya, and then just end one single word, Tyler, his son. All of those being the things that are important, what's really important in life, how we waste time on things that aren't significant, but we don't treasure and value what really are, which I think is one of Mandel's key views and values that she's emphasizing. And on this last day, back to this last moment, there's a crown of flowers on Arthur's head. Interesting because of the connection to I prefer you with the crown, section three title. Hi, Kirsten whispers, I love the comic books. Um, and then there is this final scene um, where Arthur as King Lear is speaking and there's him dying here on page 329. He has a sharp pain clenching a weight on his chest and he remembers the bird. If you were with me in the beginning, you remember we talked about the bird symbolism um, in the first section and he remembers as he is dying, he's holding his hands to his chest. And there's something familiar about this motion. He remembers when he was seven years old, Delano Island, and him and his brother found a wounded bird on the beach. And his line is, the wren goes to it. And he's thinking of the bird, the wren, his line, the wren. And my claim here is this wounded bird actually also is mirrored in Arthur, represents Arthur who's wounded by regrets metaphorically as well as being wounded by this actual death by heart attack at this moment. So he's both physically wounded and metaphorically wounded by the weight of his regret. And um, Arthur's cradled his hands to his heart exactly as how he'd held the bird. So this bird dying, wounded, just like him. And so at this moment he's dying, he sees the stage lights and they're leaving trails through the darkness the way this comet had. And he's got this memory of this comet, Hyakutake, which is suspended like a lantern in the cold sky. So some of those powerful memories, moments, important people who are important to him, light, um, hope, beauty, um, the natural world, the miracles that we should hold on to. And he's thinking of these things. And he thought the snow is falling around him, shining in the lights, and he thought that it is the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And so his last thoughts are of the beauty of this last moment. And there is a weird section here, <laughs> 54. Oh my goodness, I wish I can work out what this means. I've just written, I don't understand. Somebody, if you understand, if you can work out why this is here, it's symbolic, it's definitely important. Mandel has not placed this whole novel purposefully to have this for no reason, but I honestly can't work it out. So you guys can think about that. Um, it is Dr. Lonigan, who I think represents Tyler. Um, so Dr. Levin. Kirsten visited by the ghosts of Tyler. Miss, uh, look, I don't know. You can let me know. And the very last chapter, 55, The Travelling Symphony. And um, they left the airport and as they left, they have performed Shakespeare and music on alternative evenings and people who are left in the airport are actually whispering fragments of Shakespeare to themselves and they've clearly been impacted by the beauty of the art that they've experienced during the symphony's visit. Um, Kirsten's given Clark a copy of the Station 11, a Dr. 11 comic, um, which she doesn't want to pay part with but she values it and she wants to make sure that it's safe. Um, so valuing the things and saving the things of value um, in this case, the Dr. Eleven comic, however, um, metaphorically representing the things of value that we should all be valuing in our lives. Um, and they're heading out, not to their usual territory, they're going there, heading towards where they've seen this southern town with the electrical grid and the lights. Um, they promise to come back and um, 
swap over these Doctor Eleven comics as they come back, and now they leave, and Clark is dusting his beloved objects, and he's reading the Adventures of Doctor Eleven, and he sees a familiar scene, a dinner party on Station Eleven, and he's reminded of the dinner party with Miranda and um, Arthur that he was part of, and some of the lines are exactly the same. You know, I tra spent some time in Czech Republic in Praha, and he recognises this dinner party, and he was there, and the, the, the characters are there, and Elizabeth is there, and Clark is there, and Arthur is there, and only Miranda is missing, but Dr Eleven is there. Obviously, Miranda is taking the place of Dr Eleven, and um, and, and so then it's Clark's memory of this moment and he thinks of Miranda and he wonders about all the people that have gone, the ghosts, um, the people who've left, I guess, his life. And he thinks, he wonders. Planes have been grounded for 20 years. He doesn't expect to ever see a plane again. But he wonders, is it possible that there are ships setting out? Because Miranda has gone into shipping, he remembers. There's towns with street lights and there's symphonies and there's newspapers. Well, what else might this awakening world contain? Perhaps vessels are setting out even now, travelling towards or away from him, steered by sailors and maps and knowledge of the stars, driven by need or perhaps simply by curiosity, whatever became of the countries on the other side. If nothing else, it's pleasant to consider the possibility. He likes the thought of ships moving over the waters towards another world just out of sight. And Clark is clearly content in his final moments. Um, there's a meditation or a reflection on this possibility of exploration, this hope for the new world, a new discovery, um, new um, adventures. Um, not necessarily the ships themselves, but what they represent, I believe. So this chapter is one of hope. I've just taken this from the ATAR study guides. Um, the Travelling Symphony, leave to follow this pinpricks of electricity um, where Kirsten will meet the man in the audience. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure about this analysis. I'm just going to do that Mandel suggests that life is too short and too fragile to drift through without meaning. She urges individuals to chase your passion and thrive while appreciating the world and the people in it. So that is... The end of Station 11.